If you've ever hit a speed limit with either of your hands or either of your feet and you're losing patience and you're frustrated to no end over how to solve it, then today's lesson is for you. Without employing the stick control tempo method, which I'm teaching you today, your limbs will always be running up against a hard speed wall that could drive you crazy for years. Today I'm helping you solve this avoidable issue so that you're quickly scaling up in tempo and able to play as quickly and smoothly as you need for the music that you want to play. You can do this. Hey, welcome to The Non-Glamorous Drummer. I help self-taught beginner drummers know what to practice so that they can nail songs and become the drummer that others want to jam with. And hey, while you're here, I've got a free gift for you. If you're dealing with a weak hand, in other words, both hands don't look or sound the same, and maybe that left hand just doesn't cooperate and it's driving you nuts, well, you have gotta fix that if you wanna master the drums. Everything gets so much easier when you solve the weak hand. So I want you to enroll in my totally free three steps to eliminating your weak hand mini course. You can go sign up for it for free in the description below. It's three lessons, each breaking down a critical component of eliminating that weak hand. So that both hands are gripping the same and looking the same and moving the same and then building strength equally so that you can play whatever you wanna play without a weak hand getting in the way. And so my free gift to you, go grab that. It's in the, in the description below. All right, let's get on with today's lesson. So you're stuck at whatever the speed wall is uh, and whatever it is you're trying to play, whether it's singles, maybe your singles are hitting a tempo wall, your doubles are hitting a wall, maybe your right foot singles are hitting a wall, whatever it is, doesn't matter. There's a particular point at which you just can't go any faster and things just stiffen up and get really sloppy. Well, a student of mine recently was facing this exact same issue where her doubles were just very stiff and clumsy and it kind of turned into, you know, that kind of thing where it's like, what is going on here? They're getting tighter and, and stiffer as she goes faster. And this was something that she dealt with for a while until she started to utilize what we're talking about today, the stick control tempo method, which uh, pretty much solved it for her. And it was, it was pretty incredible the results she got from taking this approach to practicing her doubles. And then she was able to scale much quicker in tempo and everything got smoother. It was really cool. So I hope the same for you today. I think this is gonna help you out a whole bunch. When you implement the stick control tempo method, you solve technical issues quickly and are then able to avoid speed walls and play faster. So what is this? What is the stick control tempo method? So this is not something I came up with. This is something that the much smarter George Lawrence Stone came up with. This is just my adaptation, interpretation of it. Something that he says in the instructions for how to practice the stick control patterns, which are just various sticking patterns, if you're unfamiliar with this old 1930s method, good stuff. But he's describing, here's how you need to practice it. Practice it with the metronome, practice at different tempos, but also, and I quote, he said, starting very slowly, gradually accelerating to top speed, then slowing down again, finally ending at the original tempo. That's a method of practice that we don't do much, do we? He's talking about the whole concept of and so on, gradually getting faster and then slowing back down again. We tend to not really do that and we're also very accustomed to practicing with a metronome, which is not a bad thing, and we need to practice to a metronome, but a lot of times we, we fixate on tempo numbers, and all right, this was my tempo number today, I'm gonna shoot for this one tomorrow, and this one the next day, and I'm constantly gonna be pushing faster and faster, and sometimes that is to our detriment, because we're focusing so much on getting quicker that we're neglecting those slower tempos that this is forcing us to revisit. So, when learning a new technique, rudiment, pattern, motion, literally anything, Whatever it is around the kit, we're kind of talking about singles, doubles, foot singles, you know, those basics today, but whatever it is you're practicing, could be anything. Practice it slow to fast, and then back to slow again, in addition to fixed tempos with your metronome. So keep doing the fixed tempos with your metronome, but also practice doing the starting really slow, and then going faster, and then slowing back down, because that's gonna be a critical piece of your practice, and that's what we're getting into today. So here's what this might look like with singles. Now, the key is starting really slow. A lot of times when, when I have students do this, I'll say, okay, do your singles really slow to fast and then back to slow again, and they start off like this. You know, and within six seconds, they're already at a blazing tempo. No, you have gotta be more patient with it than that. Start off crazy slow. Like, I, I don't know what tempo number. Point is really, really slow like this. And don't be in a hurry to get faster. I 
Imagine you've got all day, <laughs> literally. Now, in my opinion, it's more critical that you spend more time at the slow end of that than the fast end. And that was kind of the way I played that. I spent a lot of time gradually getting going, starting really slow. And then once I got to fast, okay, we were fast and we slowed back down. So it's kind of like this sort of a curve, you know, very gradual speeding up and then we speed up and then we start slowing down and then very gradually go from that mid tempo to really slow tempo. That's my opinion, that's my interpretation of this. And I feel like that is most beneficial to you if you're trying to do strength building and you're just trying to practice playing a lot of loud, fast stuff, do that with the metronome. Turn your metronome on and you know, see if you can go for a minute, five minutes, really loud and fast. I think this exercise really excels in helping you with the slow stuff. And so that's why I play that the way that I do. Another example might be doubles. What's critical here is that when you start the doubles really slow, you're fully relaxing and allowing those second notes to be rebound. If you miss that super slow area where it has to be rebound driven, you're completely missing the point of this exercise. It's critical that you start super slow. That way you're targeting what is going on at the really slow tempo. We'll talk about that a little more in a moment. Another example might be right foot bass drum. If you're struggling with singles, you just feel like they're sloppy, they're not consistent, you're not able to get a doom, 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 especially if you're trying to play like hard rock stuff that has a lot of driving, boom, 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 God, boom, 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 boom. You've got to build up the right foot strength, but also you've got to get that right foot smooth. Generally, the most sloppy part of a drummer's groove, like if, if I'm listening to just the typical drummer playing in a bar band somewhere, generally speaking, it's the kick drum that's not quite in the pocket. A lot of times, you know, hands are fine, our hands lock in pretty well, but so many times our right foot is kind of that weak link. And truly, the left foot is the weak link, but we can kind of just shove that aside and put it under the rug and not think about the left foot. Um, that's something we talk about in other lessons about how we ought to be incorporating the left foot. Topic for another lesson. But a lot of times right foot is the most audible, most obvious weak link in many drummers' grooves simply because we haven't practiced it. And even though we sit here and we play singles with our hands, we neglect to do the same thing with our foot. So take this exact same approach to your singles. Start off so slow. Makes me think of that scene in Lord of the Rings and the Fellowship of the Ring where they're inside the cave at Moria and you hear those drums in the distance and you know something ominous is coming. It's like way in the distance, but it's so slow. So slow and it's echoing for miles. That's what we wanna do here. If you're not a Lord of the Rings fan, I'm sorry. Start off super slow, gradually get faster. But remember, we're not in a hurry. These are like the war drums that are way on the other end of the mountain through miles of caves.
and so on and so on. Something you'll notice if you watch closely, and this is something else we talk about a lot in another lesson. I keep referring to other lessons because what we're doing today is we're talking about a methodology, an approach to practicing, and there's all sorts of little nitty gritty things we encounter along this approach, which is what I want to happen for you. As you're sitting here and you're working on this, I want you to notice things, but we don't have the time to go into all the little things we might run into here. Those are things we cover in other lessons. But quick tangent, what you'll notice is that the beater pattern, the way the beater's moving changes depending on the tempo. When we're going fast, it's a smooth back and forth. But we get to a certain slower tempo and it gets a little awkward, watch. Right there, suddenly it's not able to smoothly move. A lot of times that's the awkward tempo. And so what I always want you paying attention to here is where's the awkward tempo? Where is it feeling weird? Where's the motion kind of off? Is it something like kick drum where there's really nothing you can do to avoid that? That's just the way it is. You just gotta practice that tempo. Or with your hands, is there something funny happening with your grip at a certain spot? Where is that? This exposes that. This forces you to notice all of those things. And that's why this works. That is why this whole thing works and why this is a powerful method that we just forget about that's right here and it's been right here in front of us for 90 something years. Biggest problem that I see in students practicing is that they're not spending enough time practicing something slowly. We're just, we're in such a hurry and it's just, it's kind of the way, you know, it's, it just sums up our lives, you know. We're always in a hurry. We're always driving somewhere fast. We're always trying to get this done so we can go do that. And we're busy and we just, it, it totally carries over into our practicing where a lot of times we're just in a hurry and we're like, well, I got 30 minutes to practice today. Let me get a lot done in that 30 minutes. And there's nothing wrong with that approach. I'm a super efficient kind of person in the way I like to do things. It's always, let's get this done. Let's not let it take longer than it needs to. But sometimes we're in too much of a hurry and we neglect important critical components. This exercise keeps you revisiting the slow tempos, which is where smoothness develops. I'm gonna say that again, and it's right here on the screen for you to read. This keeps you revisiting the slow tempos, which is where smoothness develops. And what does smoothness develop into? Speed. When you get things smooth, speed follows. The smoothness happens at the slow tempos. Does that make sense? So slow practice develops smoothness, which becomes speed. If you wanna break past a speed wall, you've gotta spend a lot of time in those slow tempos. That means every time you practice your singles, if that motion is not clean at this tempo, how do you expect to be able to go? You're gonna run into problems there. If your doubles are not smooth and rebound driven right here, how do you expect them to be smooth and open here? It's just logical, but a lot of times we don't pause and ask those questions. And so that's what I want you doing. And by the way, I've kind of been saying this over and over again, but I just want to over, over additionally clarify this. Exploring all the specific nitty gritty hurdles that you might be running into as you're doing all of this is beyond the scope of today's lesson. But I'm going to link some stuff in the description to help you out even more talking about base technique and singles technique, doubles technique, um, because we've got all sorts of specific lessons on that. Today we're just talking about the overall approach. This is the approach I want you taking as you're working on your singles, doubles, paradiddles, molar, uh, any kind of motion, just any kind of thing that you're practicing. It could be a specific groove you're working on and maybe the groove is sloppy, slow it down. Practice playing the groove, uh, you know, maybe it's something weird like, Let's say you're working on something challenging, something weird from a cool song. Practice it really, really slow and practice gradually going faster with it. That's gonna completely change the way you're feeling that groove and the way that you're, you're learning it. And that's gonna help you so much at nailing it down at whatever the tempo is you need to play it at. So what this will mean for your playing going forward. I always want you thinking ahead and understanding the power of what we're practicing here and knowing here's what's gonna happen if you take action on this. Well, anytime you hit a speed hurdle, you will now know what to do, right? If you hit a problem with your singles or your doubles, you're gonna know, oh yeah, Steven said go slower. I promise you this, this is gonna help you go slow, work on that smoothness, getting, getting things fluid slowly, and then practice this, this exercise of going really slow to really fast and make sure you can smoothly transition through that tempo range and you're gonna be just fine. And so that means you've made a habit of reevaluating your technique or motion at a much slower tempo Therefore, fixing issues earlier, saving you tons of frustration. 
I wrote this down because I wanted to say it right for you because this is really critical and I want you to know this, that this, this creates a habit in your practicing of noticing issues and exposing issues. If you're not exposing problems in your technique and motion in your practicing, then you're not practicing right. This forces you to do that by constantly having you going so slow that you're having to face the issues. It's just like how Sometimes we need to take a break from our phones. We need to sit and be still and be quiet and make a habit of stillness because it forces us to face ourselves. It forces us to deal with the stuff going on in our heads that we need to filter out and that we need to deal with. And the same is true in our practicing. It's funny how life stuff so directly applies to practicing and vice versa so many times. So keep this up and you'll be playing fast. You'll be playing smoother and everything you play will be more precise and musical. Take my word for it. Take action on this, practice this, have a lot of fun. And hey, before you go, uh, two things. Make sure you go grab that weekend mini course. It's going to help you out a whole bunch. Three steps to eliminating your weekend. My free gift to you. Also, tell me in the comments, what area of your playing needs some slow, methodical practice? I think if we're all honest, it's everything. It's singles, it's doubles, it's singles down here, it's you know working on maybe a leg bounce with the left foot, it's working on molar. All of these things can benefit from slow practice. And I'll be honest with you, when I sit down and I practice, I start off with doing these things really slow. It's always my goal. Can I play really well slowly? Can I play really well softly? If I can do that, I will be a better drummer today and I will have a successful practice session. I want you taking that mindset. So what area might you have neglected or lost patience with? What do you need to revisit? What do you need to expose? If you feel so inclined, tell us in the comments. Let's talk about it. All right, I hope today's lesson has been super valuable and helpful to you. I know this concept has been so helpful to myself and to my students. And so thank you, George Lawrence Stone, for breaking, giving this to us and breaking this down for us. And so I hope that this is super helpful to you. Stay non-glamorous. As always, you can do this. I'll see you on the next lesson.